welcome to ETF Edge. This is your go-to place for everything exchange-traded funds. I'm your host, Bob Pisani. Joined today by Ben Johnson. He's the director of global ETF research at Morningstar. Dave Nodding is the managing director of ETF.com. Let's start with the markets because despite today's sell-off, stocks are still on track for the best start to a year in decades. And investors are beginning to chase that particular rally. Here's the flow down. In January, U.S. equities saw $25 billion in outflows. But in February, we had $13 billion in inflows. Other areas of the market that saw notable flows were mar emerging markets and low volatility ETFs. That's curious. So what does all this mean for the rally and what should investors be watching in March? Dave, is, it, we've talked about this for years. Are these fund flows on a monthly basis predictive of anything? What Can we make any overall conclusions? I, I sort of see them as a secondary investor sentiment indicator, right? And so when we see people coming back into U.S. equities after take, taking a breather, that to me means you can see a broad level of, of uh, sort of appetite for risk again. And really that's what we're seeing across the board. Even in things like fixed income, the things we've picked up have been high yield, longer duration fixed income. So I, I see this really as a sentiment indicator. I think it's very dangerous to use it as a trading signal. I think you're right. And but Ben, I would note here it's not just U.S. equities that saw significant uh, inflows. Emerging markets saw significant inflows as well. Can we make any conclusion here? Is, is risk appetite for uh, overseas investing returning? Yeah, if you're to look at flows, as Dave indicated, as sort of a sentiment indicator, certainly seeing large flows into U.S. stocks, emerging market stocks, long dated treasuries would seem to indicate that investors' risk appetite improved in February. That said, it's, it's difficult to divine anything from what goes on on a month-to-month -month basis in terms of flows because ETFs are used by so many different types of investors. They're used in so many different ways that there's a lot of layers to these monthly flow stories that you have to really peel back to try to understand what's truly going on. That's a very good point. We, we've often noted that ETFs are not just done by buy and hold investors, they're used as a tactical allocation. So people will come in, active traders will come in and out of that. And you've got to be careful about making any conclusions. Yeah. And I think we saw that in some of the flows that we've seen. Some of the more traded products, I tend when I see a big flow there, I think, ah, this is traders getting back in. So for instance, like MBB, which is a mortgage-backed securities ETF, that's used by traders predominantly to really get quick exposure to that core section of the market. What do you make of the fact that low volatility suddenly has had a lot of inflows? Now, low volatility are, are, are companies that are uh, defensive generally. They pay high dividends. So you get pharmaceutical stocks. Yep. You get uh, Pepsi, Johnson & Johnson. You get McDonald's kind of uh, things like that. Are investors a little worried about the, the speed of the rally? Oh, for sure, for sure. I mean, and when I see money flow into things like USMV, which is the US Minval Fund, right? I think that investors are looking to get risk on, but they're looking to be a little cautious. So they're, they're pulling money out of true safety assets like short-term bonds, but they're being a little cautious about their equity exposure. And Ben, based on what you've been seeing in flows so far this year, what do you, what's your thoughts on March? Do you think we're going to continue to see some money in, into the more defensive names, or do we see any sign of, of, of significant breakouts? What about, for example, European equities? We've been waiting for a long time for Europe to bottom. That's sort of the next bull argument, uh, even though the data doesn't support it. What are you seeing right now? Yeah, difficult to say, but I, I think to, to keep on the, the thread of low vol flows in particular, I think what many investors are seeing is that that might be a perfectly acceptable substitute for active equity portfolios. If you think about sort of the, the calling card of a lot of active stock pickers for years, it's been, hey, we're gonna take out some of the sting out of the downside. And what you've seen is that a lot of these low vol strategies, which for all intents and purposes are active strategies, have done exactly that and done so pretty reliably based on a small sample of drawdowns in the market that we've seen. So I think people wanna maintain that equity exposure, but do so in a way that's going to kind of take that sting out of, of the downdraft that will hopefully keep them invested come the next bear market. So I think that actually explains, at least amongst the buy and hold crowd, a lot of the flows we've seen into low vol strategies. Yeah, we've been debating value versus growth for a long time, but let's talk about growth. If you want to beat the markets this year, you might want to pay close attention to our next guest who has doubled the S&P returns in 2019, Kathy Woods. ARK Innovation ETF, that symbol is A-R-K-K, -K, is up 23% so far this year. The broader S&P only up 11%. Biggest holding in the A-R-K-K, 
Tesla. <laughs> it makes up nearly 10%. She says that stock could rally more than 1,000% over the next few years. Let's bring in Kathy Wood, CEO and CIO of ARK Invest. Do you, you still have a $4,000 price target on Tesla? Yes. This is long term, I this know. This is a five-year uh, time horizon. Uh, that's what all of our forecasting is. 4,000 is the bull case, 700 is the bear case. It's rare, it's rare for us to have a stock that meets our minimum hurdle rate of return in the bear case. So <laughs> it's north of 15% compound annual rate of return to get to our bear case target. Give us the 20 second case for why Tesla could go to 4,000 in five years. Yes. Uh, well, first, they are scaling the electric vehicle market. We think the electric vehicle sales in two, uh, 2023 will be uh, in total globally 23 or 26 million units, up from 1.3 million last year. So that's a 20-fold increase. We're talking about exponential growth, but that's not the big story for Tesla. The big story is autonomous taxi platforms. We're moving from a hardware-centric, low gross margin model, which is 25, 30%, to a transportation as a service model, they'll get uh, a piece of the of every ride taken because they'll own the platform uh, that these fleet operators will be riding on, and uh, that's more of an 80% gross margin business. Yeah. So, and that's that. We just did a yeah. podcast with Elon Musk two weeks ago, uh, and if anyone really wants to understand what's going on in his head, we're talking about. Exponential growth. And where growth, can they hear that if linear. they want to hear it quickly? It's, uh, it's FYI Innovation. It's our podcast. Okay. For, uh, for your innovation. You know, Dave, Kathy's become a little bit of a star for in sure. the active management field. There aren't many stars in the <laughs> active management field, right. I should say, in the ETF uh, business, because Kathy's willing to take outsized bets. I mean, we're dealing with what, Kathy? Your top 10 or 56, 60% of the fund is 10 stocks, and but, really it's five. You've got Stratasys, <laughs> NVIDIA, 6%. Weightings. I mean, what do you, what do you, you, you got to love somebody like Kathy that really say, makes a big bet on a small number of, of stocks. Yeah, I mean, that what are you're there. doing is what you want out of an active manager, and frankly, what's so rare in active management, right? If I'm going to make a bet on an active manager, I don't want them owning 300 positions yeah. and right. giving 10 basis point positions. Right. So I think what you're doing. You know, obviously it's been working, but it's also really honest active management in the sense that you're not only showing what you own, but you're standing behind it and you're taking those big bets. And Ben Johnson, why isn't there more Kathy Woods uh, out there? Is it just hard? They're not, people aren't that good at active management, is, well, which is what it seems to be at this point. What, what's the problem? Why aren't there more Kathy I, Woods? I think it's difficult. The, the other question, if I may, for Kathy is, is how you think about kind of managing the balance between sort of conviction and, and capacity with a very concentrated portfolio when you're operating that portfolio within an, an ETF. Uh, we've seen a lot of similar portfolios in the open-ended mutual fund world, you know, know when they have enough and be able to close the fund to investors. And to a certain extent, you don't outright forfeit that ability in an ETF construct, but what would result would be a closed-end fund. So how do you think about that? Well, the great thing about focusing on exponential growth and disruptive innovation is we should be able to grow exponentially if we are right on these five innovation platforms that we think each represent multi-trillion dollar opportunities. So DNA sequencing, robotics, energy storage, deep learning, blockchain technology. But are there some small caps that you kind of have to avoid because it's a big fund now. It's a you know billion plus dollar fund. Can you really own a $50 million company you know, in that portfolio? There is such fear out there about volatility associated with innovation. Volatility, by the way, is a very good thing on the upside, <laughs> right? Uh, there is so much fear that we get opportunities all the time to buy stocks that are destroyed, especially the small cap stocks, just because people are afraid. They're not in indexes. They dump them during a correction. We consolidate uh, our holdings. And if we get an opportunity to buy a nano string or an Invite uh, during those downturns, they earn their way up into the top 10. And all of these are actively managed. You, you have yes. more than just one fund. Yes. The ARK, ARKK, your flagship is a billion and a half assets under managed, but you have the ARK Web X.0, which yeah. obviously yeah. deals with uh, internet and web related. You have the ARK Genomic Revolution, which is ARKJ, obviously dealing with genomic issues, industrial innovation uh, uh, ARK yes. uh, that's out there. These are all, yeah, they are, they're all actively managed. Is that right? 
Yes, and the other reason you're not seeing a lot of active managers out there in the ETF world is we have to disclose our holdings at the end of every day. We are a liquidity provider. We don't mind showing our holdings because we're usually buying stocks like Tesla when they're down, and we're usually taking profits when they're up. So in the fourth quarter, yeah. Tesla screamed while NVIDIA crashed. Very quickly, how, yeah. before we move on, how do you change your position? I mean, suppose, do, will you announce at any one time, I'm going to go from a 9% weighting in, in Tesla to 6%? How does this process happen? You don't, the, the, the most of re, rebounds on a quarterly basis, right. for example, if you're yes. equal weighted, what do, yes. how do you rebalance or what do you? We trade every day. Uh -huh. I, I'm not doing anything different now than I did uh, when I was managing mutual funds, separately manage accounts, and we do manage those as well at ARC. Uh, it's the same. The wrapper, we're wrapper agnostic. There's, so if, there's so no if you difference decide to sell over. Tesla, we'll just find out when we look tomorrow and Tesla's not in the well, portfolio. Well, actually, we post our trades once we've completed them. Uh, and the reason for that is market makers were so uncomfortable with this idea of an active manager. They felt they'd be caught flat-footed. Then we said, fine, we'll post our trades once we've completed them so that we're both on the right side of this well, thing. Well, the, the proof is in the pudding. So far, you've been outperforming, and it's very tough to get active management outperforming. So kudos to you. Just stick around, Kathy. Thank I want you. to want you get your, uh, your thoughts here on this last segment. We'll end with a little myth-busting, as we usually do here. Today, we're looking at the Race to Zero ETFs. Our dear friend Jason Swig, you see him in the Wall Street Journal there last week out with an article over the weekend titled, Why You Should Think Twice About Free Funds, highlighting how expense-free doesn't necessarily mean risk-free. So how do these funds actually do zero ETFs? Well, there's a number of ways that happen, including lending stock to clients. They also sell other products. And of course, oftentimes, Dave, they'll have lower interest on their cash funds. Yep. Uh, nothing is free is, I think, the point here that Jason's making, we've made, Many. Yeah, it's absolutely true. And I think there's also a question of diminishing returns. I mean, we just saw the launch of or the filing of some zero fee funds for a while. They'll, they have a waiver for a year. The question you have to ask yourself, is that really better than, say, the three basis points you pay Vanguard for similar exposure? Yeah. That's $30 on a $100,000 portfolio every year. Most people spend that on pizza without even thinking about right. it. Right. Uh, have we made too much of all of this, Ben? Zero. I mean, the public seems loving just free anything. Well, I'll buy it. <laughs> Uh, but $3 <laughs> per 10,000 for three basis points doesn't make that much a difference if you're making up for it or paying for it in, a, in other ways. So, in other words, are we making too much of this free ETF uh, business? Uh, absolutely, it, especially as we get ever nearer zero. I mean, I think if anything, there's a big risk that investors could be kind of penny wise, pound foolish, that they unlock sort of a tax genie by moving wholesale from one platform to another that they're increasingly incurring costs that are less directly visible, less measurable in the form of opportunity costs. So I'm earning 0.01% on my cash balance as opposed to two and a quarter percent, which I could be getting you know, at a, an online savings account. So you know, costs are, are beginning to kind of creep into the dark. There's no such thing as free. If you're getting something for free, Odds are you're subsidizing that by paying for something else, whether explicitly or implicitly. Right. Now, Kathy, your funds are not free, uh, yeah. nor are they three basis points, but we're paying for your insights and innovation, right? right? But yeah. it, do you agree with the general point? Um, low cost is not always necessarily, don't always just buy low cost just because it's three basis points or five basis points. Right. So our, our fee, I mean, we are doing a lot of original research. What, what is your fee for the 75 ARK? basis points. Okay. So that would compare to maybe 1.25 for a mutual fund, right? Um, what we believe is happening with these zero fee funds is that they, they tend to be the broad-based indices, right? Easy just to mimic an index, doesn't cost very much to do that. A machine can do that. Uh, but we think they are filling up with value traps because of all of the innovation uh, that we're researching. Uh, so we think, we think we're at the beginning of the pendulum shift away from passive back to active as more and more people recognize this. Well, we'll see. That's going to yeah. be a very, we've been dealing with that call for a very, very yeah. long time. Yeah. It hasn't yeah. happened yet, but uh, there's not a lot of Cathy's out there, though. <laughs> That's part of the problem. Definitely. you got to admit, am I wrong? Definitely true. Not. Definitely um, true. Where do you find them? You're, you're one of the <laughs> well, very, in her office, we dragged apparently. you over here. You know, <laughs> it's like seeing a unicorn. Like, here you are. Hey, an active manager that actually outperforms. We finally found one. <laughs> no, well, I think innovation is key. Yeah. Innovation and exponential growth. I yeah. think in a slow growth world, 
uh, you've got to have some innovation. All right, Kathy, thanks yeah, very thanks much so for much. joining thanks, us. Bob. Folks, that uh, yeah. does it for this week's ETF Edge. I'm Bob Bassani. My thanks to Kathy and David, of course. And Ben, thank you for joining us today. Thank you all for watching. You can find all of our latest videos right here on our website, ETFedge.com. CNBC.com. We'll see you next Monday, same time, same place. Have a good week.